The time is upon us. The floodgates are opening. Total War Warhammer 3 is launching. If you're watching this the day it's posted, then you're one day away from endless glory in the Chaos Realms. Otherwise, your hands are already steeped in the blood of the many campaigns that Total War Warhammer 3 has to offer across its launch races as well as pre-order DLC, The Ogre Kingdoms. With 12 campaigns on the line, there is a question of difficulty. How hard of an experience do you want for your first time in Warhammer 3? Do you want to struggle for grip as you climb a muddy hill of outrageous fortune? Or do you want to slick down a slide of gore as you pummel your way to victory? In this video today, I want to help list all the campaigns from easiest to hardest, giving you an idea of which campaigns to either avoid if you're new or jump headlong into if you're looking for a challenge. Now, I do have a series that gives you a nice spoiler-free campaign overview of each of these campaigns, which you can find linked in the upper right corner and end of the video. So once you pick one you like, you can just kind of head there for more detail. We'll be judging these campaigns off of their campaign mechanics, overall difficulty, and barrier of entry as we look at each campaign in the game, listing them from easiest to hardest. Please keep in mind that this is by no means an indication of fun. I found the hardest and the easiest campaigns on this list to be extremely fun for different reasons, so do not write them off because of difficulty. I promise they're all quite enjoyable. Also, this is not set in stone. While I believe the top, bottom, and middle are a solid indicator of difficulty, it's really an opinion-based list with lots of it changing the second we get more lords added to the game. So please, don't feel deterred if your favorite lord is towards the harder spectrum. Now, if this is your first time on my channel, I like to upfront the knowledge in my videos so you can stick around to find out my reasonings if you'd like. With that being said, you can find each and every campaign listed in the chapters in the timeline and the description. Feel free to jump ahead to the campaigns that interest you the most to hear my thoughts. I'd like to also give a huge shout out to Indie Pride from Milk and Cookies Total War, who helped me in compiling this list. So please go and check his channel out, namely his video on how to get a critical boost in the early portions of your campaign. Before we get started, if you have not yet picked up Warhammer 3, you can support the channel by using the link to my Nexus store. Nexus provides Steam keys directly from the developer and I get a cut of every sale, which helps keep the channel alive. Cannot tell you how much it helps. But lastly, if you end up enjoying the content, please don't forget to like, comment, or subscribe. Again, another thing that I cannot tell you how much it really does help out. But let's get started here on campaigns ranked from easiest to hardest in Total War Warhammer 3. And to open our video up is the first on our list, Scarbrand, the Exiles of Corn here, which I find to be the easiest campaign and to be totally transparent with you, my favorite campaign in Total War Warhammer 3. It is just so fun to reap a huge tally of skulls in the name of Corn. And you do that really easily by looking at the faction effects here. For Wrathful Reaper, we get an army replenishment in foreign territory, which is great. You're going to be spending a lot of time in foreign territory with uh, Scarbrand here. Also, campaign movement range plus 25% after raising a settlement, which is just lovely. You couple that with the bad boy himself's actual campaign effects. He further moves an additional 35% after winning a battle, and recruitment cost is reduced by 35%. So they, those things stack up very well especially when you look at the skull's throne ability up here which further increases that campaign movement range by 25 percent so you can see that winning battles can cause essentially this value train where you just reap through the land destroying everything in the name of corn and it makes things very fun because the the nicest thing about playing a scar brand is when you look at the actual stats of this character He's just stupid strong in combat. Uh, of course, when it comes to, to range, he's going to suffer. There's not a lot of range, period, when it comes to corn. There's one thing that does range damage. But he can just rip the face off of any other legendary lord in the game. If they can, he can get his uh, wings, well, his torn apart wings on him, he can just destroy them. And his skills and everything, they work so well in conjunction to making a lot of the strengths even stronger for your campaign that you can just pop off, man. Like, you can get so strong in this campaign, and I love it so much taking a look at his start position he really only has one direct op piece, or piece of opposition and that's nakari right over here after you solidify your first province then maybe your second one over here to give yourself some more uh, economy such as gold some more income to make the top tier units of corn 
you're really done empire building. Remember, Corn's about destroying everything. So you can start using Rifts to jump apart to other portions of the campaign map, like Cathay or down to Kislev or even into the old world, and just kill everything. You can make these blood hosts. You can really just go wild. And I think the biggest thing that Corn has going for it, especially if you're brand new to the game, is looking at the unit browser, there's no magic, period. So while that is a good thing, it's not necessarily something you should really rely upon if you're brand new to the game because magic is very integral. But for corn, there's no magic. So all you have to worry about is marching forward and killing. You don't have any backline to support or make sure they stay safe or anything like that. This is your only actual uh, ranged piece is your skull cannon. The rest is just going to march forward and kill things. Well, actually, the, uh, the soul grant, I always forget, it does have some range here. And all you have to do is just march into them, kill them, that's it. That's all you got to worry about. So I think that as far as this being an easy faction to jump into for old and for new players, it's so simple. You just, like I've said like two times now, march forward, kill things. You have so many mechanics that facilitate that. And I find that you'll really enjoy your first playthrough as Scarbrand. Moving into Cathay, we can talk about Zhao Ming, another really fun campaign that is on the easiest parts portions of the spectrum here, but is still filled with a lot of really cool mechanics and great ways to play the campaign. So let's take a look here at his actual lore mechanics here in Ruler of the Western Provinces. The two big standout ones I want to talk about, well, three. One is maximum cargo capacity increased by 20% for caravans, upkeep reduction for ogre mercenaries by 25%, and then armor plus 15 for melee units. This all stacks up very well with Zhao Ming's actual campaign effects of upkeep reduction for melee units by 25%, also, his skills in here of desert weapons increasing weapon strength for melee units by 15% and, and iron strength increasing that melee attack for your melee units by 10%. So you can see that there is a theme. And also when it com comes to the uh, ogres, you get, oh, here it is, Lord of Shang Yang further reducing that upkeep for ogre mercenaries by 25%, stacking up to 50 and recruitment cost reduction by 25% for ogre mercenaries. Also, it's nice to have that diplomatic relation. Looking also back at the campaign effects too, uh, magic item drop chance plus 100% means that every time Zhao Ming fights someone, he gets a magic item. This works really well with the new fuse and salvage mechanics that come with the game, meaning that you can fuse together two things of the same durability and the same item type into a random secondary one. So you've got two green ones, you can make a blue, or you just salvage it and get some money. So you constantly have a flow of magic items that you can outfit on Zhao or any of your other lords, characters, or caravan masters. And the caravan mechanic is another badass thing with Zhao Ming. So you can just see from campaign and from Lord effects, Yes, there's a heavy emphasis on melee units, and I think that the Cathayan melee units are really kick-ass, especially the Sentinel. It's one of my favorite units in the entire roster, and he himself is really good in combat, which I, I do love. Also, if you want to play very heavily with Ogre Mercenaries, you can see that you now get a further discount in using them because you start so close to them. So let's look at the caravan mechanic, because this the ivory road mechanic here, well, I don't know why it's showing me this, but you have this mechanic that you can use to further increase your value as Zhao Ming, because you get the ability to increase the cargo value that you're sending out across the land. And when you visit these locations, you also have the chance of getting particularly good items like the Von Karstein Blade by going over here to Sylvania. All these things make for a very fun campaign, but why is this particularly easy? Well, for one, when you take a look at the relative starting location here of Zhao Ming, he is tucked into the actual like hinterlands of Cathay. Miao Ying is right over here with the Great Bastion right there, right? So she's kind of right up against the, the, the furnace, as it were. There are no other legendary lords that are around Zhao. He can just kind of gobble up everything around here. And there are some ogre kingdoms over here with Ivory Road being where Greece starts right there. So the closest opposing legendary lord is where this cursor is by comparison to where Zhao is. So he has a lot of chances to just eat up a lot of NPC factions or even confederate with a lot of Cathayan factions. And he'll have positive diplomatic relations with any of the ogre factions that you want to stay friends with. So pretty much you have free run of this portion of the map, this portion of the board. 
and you have a very strong character to do it with. Even looking at your unit browser here, you get a lot of really great melee units to take advantage of. And again, to the construct here, which is just a really strong, awesome unit, one of my favorite units in the game. Miao Ying goes with the heavy emphasis on missile infantry. But again, I find that the melee infantry of Cathay to be really enjoyable in conjunction with a very strong character here with Zhao. So all these things in conjunction make for Zhao to be a uh, very easy campaign because he's his economy is just not going to be threatened he is going to take off and have so much money to have so much fun with the new Cathay stuff our first Kislev legendary lord is Boris Ursus, and he has a very interesting campaign as he is the only character to start in the Darklands here at launch of Total War Warhammer 3. And he is also the most recently announced legendary lord. So looking at his actual campaign effects, his faction effects, he gets some diplomatic relation bonuses, some construction cost reductions and whatnot. The biggest thing on this list, though, is his recruitment rank of plus two for Warbear Riders. That is obviously going to be the name of the game with this big daddy with the Red Czar. Um, he also gives a bonus of leadership and melee attack when fighting against Warriors of Chaos, Demons of Chaos, and Norska, but really, again, it's all about the upkeep reduction for Warbear Riders. Looking at his skills, too, he has ways to just completely abuse his bonus versus large, which starts at 25, that he can actually get it uh, stacked up here to an additional 24, and then his actual uh, new weapon gives him an additional 12. So he is a beater of worlds when it comes to fighting against other demons. And if we look at uh, Brother of Bra Bears here, he gets a further increase of weapon strength for War Bear Riders and Elemental Bears of 16%. Stack that with this right here, and you're increasing your, your War Bear Riders melee attack by 8 and their weapon strength by an additional 12%. So you can really see that you can have a Doom stack of War Bears as Boris Ursus, a full 20 stack of bears, and just rip through the land. And that's that's really what it kind of comes down to with Boris. And it's the same thing with Zhao, and the next Legendary Lord we talk about will be very similar in this situation, in that right now, in the current iteration of the game, there's no direct opposition to a lot of these characters. We'll find that when we get more DLC characters, that will be, that will definitely change. If we look at this location of Zorn Uzkul, we have Zar Nagrun right here, which is where the Chaos Dwarfs would start if they were in the game. So this legendary Lord start for Boris Ursus will be essentially you painting the map in the colors of Kislev until the Chaos Dwarfs or any other faction come in to directly oppose Boris. And even moreover, if you look at the campaign mechanics of the Motherland, you can completely ignore the supporters portion and use the Motherland portion whenever you see fit. So being able to ignore portions of the Kislev mechanics and just kind of control the land as you see fit makes this a pretty easy campaign, especially because you start with two Warbear Riders. So your ability to have a quick power spike once you hard tech into making Warbear Riders makes this campaign one that you can just reef through the entire Darklands. The closest Legendary Lords to you would be Kugoth Plaguefather around here or so. In fact, can't really get it. Oh, trying to have me move over there. I think it's right around. Uh, that's actually that's where that's where Scarbrand is. It's actually be a little bit closer, so it'd be around in this area, and then Greasus is right over here. Then you've got Kislev in this direction. So really, this entire portion of the map is yours for the taking. So this really becomes a fun campaign to really explore the strengths of Kislev throughout the Darklands. Now, our first ogre on the list is Scrag the Slaughter. I think now after this, we've gone through every single faction in the game across Cathay, Demons, Kislev, and now Ogres. But Scrag the Slaughterer gets a lot of the same benefits that Boris does, in that he doesn't have any real direct opposition from other legendary lords on the map, and he also gets a lot of bonuses towards one of the better units in the Ogre Kingdom's roster. So let's take a look at the actual uh, effects here, the um, campaign or faction effects for the Disciples of the Maw, he gets campaign movement range plus 10%. The hero recruitment rank and capacity for butchers, while nice, is not a big focus here. It's that mainly that campaign 10% uh, movement rate. Looking at the actual 
battle effects here, or the campaign effects from Scrag, he increases the casualty replenishment rate of Gorgers by 8% and the upkeep reduction by them by 50%, which is significant. Looking at skills too, he can summon them onto the battlefield using Gorger Onslaught, and Driven by Visions gives him a further 8% campaign movement rate. Stack that with Route Marcher, you're looking at an additional 5% campaign movement rate. He has so many ways to buff his campaign movement rate, which is great because it allows him to just move quickly across the map and destroy everything. Also, he does get access to the lore of Great Maw, which I find to be a particularly good lore, especially for the Ogres. You can mitigate their low armor and their missile resistance with stuff like Toothcracker, and you can get a really good heal in with Troll Guts. And their lore attribute, meaning any time that they cast a spell, they also get a heal. So these are all really great things to put together. And they also get um, the ability to just innately increase his um, gorgers here with their armor and their charge bonus from beasts of the mountain now all this stuff kind of comes together very well because if you look at the offer to the great maw the mechanic here for the ogres he can further increase his campaign movement range by 20 percent there are just so many ways to give scrag wheels across the battlefield and if we're looking at gorgers which he starts with three of they have great ap armor piercing and great bonus versus infantry allowing them to do just heaps of damage in the early portion against dwarfs which you'll be fighting with a ton and they have vanguard and i'm sorry they got vanguard they've got stock and they're unbreakable and once you get his actual his actual um quest item he can heal them and increase their base weapon damage and armor piercing. So he can just get a value train on Gorgers and it really is destructive. Another big thing is his start position. He's tucked over here in the corner of the map. There's nothing around him and he gets access to two pretty immediate provinces. You'll be able to get the northern and southern Grey Mountains by turn four or five, maybe even ten at the latest. And the nice thing is... There's one province entrance over here and one province entrance over here. By taking those and fortifying them, the AI can't really attack the rest. So it allows you to have a very solid base to take over the entire old world if you want to. A lot of um, other content creators' early campaigns have Scrag the Slaughterer getting out of control with like 30, 35 settlements. So if you want to play the Ogre Kingdoms and you want to just go completely crazy through the old world with little to no opposition, Trust me, Scrag the Slaughterer will definitely be the man for you. Next up is Zinch, and Kairos Fateweaver is a very fun lord. He moves up a little bit higher on the difficulty scale because I think if you're brand new to the game, the micromanagement of the actual army itself will be a little tedious for you. But once I think you kind of get beyond that hurdle, you'll find that a lot of the campaign mechanics and the actual army composition of Zinch itself is so powerful that you'll be able to deal a lot of damage and take over a good swath of the map. So looking at the actual faction effects, to be totally honest, they're not amazing like there's nothing about them that is broken battle reinforcement time and time prediction is kind of cool hero action success chance is also kind of nifty but it's not what makes kairo so strong and it's the same thing here for this campaign effects enemy hero action success chance is nice they're not going to be hindering you as much and ambush defense chance again okay but the big things here are in your skills so when we take a look at the health bar over here, you see this little blue one, it shows us Barrier. Now, Barrier is a new mechanic exclusive to Zinch. If you've played StarCraft, think of this as a Protoss shield in the exact same way. So once it depletes, it has a chance of regenerate. It will regenerate, actually. Not, not, it doesn't have a chance. It will slowly replenish when not taking damage. So basically, you can think of this as a hard additional cap of health that has the chance to just completely replenish if a unit gets attacked. And you have ways to increase this on the actual uh, line here for um, for Zinch. So with Accursed Horrors, you're going to increase the barrier by 10% for pretty much all the units that matter for you. Blue Horrors, Pink Horrors, and Exalted Pink Horrors, which you'll be using tons of. Your Thaumaturgic Rejuvenation helps with replenishment and replenishment rate, increasing and decreasing by 25% when the respective situations. Your Barrier increasing for Lord of Change units, but this one, Barrier plus 20% during battles for your entire army. That is really, really, really good. 
and attribute mastery of the elemental winds for iridescent horrors cultists and lords of change allowing you to get a stacking bonus to all of your spells and of course this is zinch so you have access to these fragments which give you certain spells from other lores so if you want healing you've now got that on top of your rejuvenating barrier there are just so many little things like this you can abuse. In addition to changing of the ways is the, is the Zinch mechanic that allows you just to straight up transfer a settlement into your clutches if you so wish. And since you start in the corner of the map like this, really once you solidify this region over here, you, you are pretty much in a very good strong position to then just move out how you want. If you want to jump into Cathay and start wreaking havoc through here, you can push down over into this direction if you so wish. You just have so many directions and you feel, I, I honestly, I feel so safe when playing Kairos and especially because of his unit browser. Because you've got all these units that essentially do missile damage, your auto resolve is slightly inflated to be particularly strong. So you can spend a lot of time moving through large waves of battles by simply auto resolving them because your units are cheap and inexpensive. They do suffer from some casualty replenishment rate issues, but at the same time, like I said, they're cheap and inexpensive. You can just go ahead and swap new ones in and combine them out. And they have such good barriers that when you do jump into actual combat, your pink, exalted pink, and blue horrors will be able to just anchor your line while Forsaken maybe jump into the four, or you charge from the flanks with your Chaos Knights, or you use Flamers to rip apart your enemy. Whatever it is, you have such a great actual roster here with Barriers being a huge champion of the Zinch roster. But this should give you a good idea now of how powerful Kairos Fate Weaver can be. Moving back to Cathay, we have Miao Ying. Now, this is where things start to get a little bit more difficult. I still think that Miao Ying is on the easier spectrum, but I will say that if you're brand new to the game, dealing with the Great Bastion mechanic means that you are forced to deal with a lot of aggression from the top side of the map, which, again, if you're new, that can be a little overwhelming. But I think that once you get a good feel for how combat works and everything, you'll be just fine. But I did want to kind of give that disclaimer up front because it's why she's a little bit higher on this list versus being lower because she still has a lot of great things going for her. So let's take a look here. Going into those faction effects here, ruler of the northern province, the big focus is that ammunition bonus for missile units. That's of course going to be her big focus compared to her brother who focuses on a, the um, melee units. So she gets also an upkeep and reduction for missile infantry units, big distinction there. And when it comes to her special little line of skills she gets imposing range which will increase the range of missile units and persistent fire helping to reduce that reload time for all missile units not just not just missile infantry then there are tons of skills in her red line that will then correspondingly give bonuses to any missile units you want to focus on so you can see that she can really stack a lot of these bonuses very well in a really cool way so you've got those capabilities then they're all over the place now, some of the big things she's got going for her, though, in her skills are stuff like Earthblood, which is a heal, and Life Bloom, which is a lore attribute, meaning that if you cast uh, Earthblood, you'll get an additional heal. Anytime you see passive ability lore, or I'm sorry, uh, lore of, well, this says lore of life in this exam example, but that passive ability is going to trip off anytime you use a spell. So getting that passive heal is quite nice. And she as a dragon is very destructive. She gets Aura of Majesty to help reduce melee defense. She gets Eye of the Storm to give her a nice boost to her combat capabilities. And she's quite strong as a dragon, period. I mean, it's a dragon, so you can't scoff at that. And looking at her start position, like I said, she starts up right here against the Great Bastion. So it does make things difficult. You do have to kind of keep an eye on the Great Bastion threat. And you have to keep all three of the gates reinforced and held properly. Or else you'll start to have a lot more opposition and invasion into your land. So those things, like I've said, can be a little difficult for brand new players to the game. But you still get all the benefits of the Ivory Road, which is great. You do get the, the chance to have your economy kind of passively get huge boosts of income from it. As you increase the cargo value and go to these locations that might give you particularly good weapons or armor as you visit, say, you know, all the way down here to Reichland and to Altdorf or into Marienburg over in this location. The further distance you go, the better you get, the, the, the higher the cargo value as well well so taking advantage of that is pretty key and her starting army is quite good because it gets two 
Oh, it gets t access to, there we go, it gets access to some Celestial Dragon and uh, Crossbowmen and Celestial Dragon Guard, as well as a Sky Junk, which helps out with the Harmony mechanic from Cathay. So while there is a bit of difficulty in the opening portions of Miao Ying's campaign, once you kind of get an understanding of how it all kind of comes together, it works very well because you have a lot of Confederation options with two different Cathayan factions over here and another one back over here. So you can once your diplomacy kind of increases blob up these factions and get quite strong you just need to kind of really survive that early onslaught and you'll be in a very strong position as you look to solidify and strengthen Cathay. Our third demon on the list is Nakari and this is where we start to jump into some of the medium difficulty bracket as we edge up closer to that uh, hard difficulty and saying edge while talking about Slanesh feels appropriate but this is a campaign that is very fun. There are a lot of cool mechanics with the seduction mechanic and with the force vassalization mechanic, but that does add quite a bit of tedium to, again, to new players, even to old players that just don't want to deal with a ton of diplomacy. You are locked into dealing with that diplomacy because it's part of the strength of playing this faction. So looking at the actual faction effects here, we do get, well, diplomatic relations plus 20 with all factions and tribute from vassals plus 50%, which is great because you will be getting a lot of vassals. Now looking to in the actual campaign effects of Nakari, we get experience gain plus 50%. Each time a new faction is fought in battle, and that's kind of cool, but it's not a huge boon. And seduce unit cost reduced by 25%, which is actually quite nice. Looking to at the skills, some of the big things that Nakari has going is that they can stack so many melee defense reductions here. So Willing Prey, minus 40 to melee defense, then Acquiescence gives an additional minus 24 to melee defense. So these things can stack up to allow Nakari to do just a disgusting amount of damage, especially when you get the Wit Stealer Sword, which has this ability, increasing their uh, base weapon and armor piercing by 100%. That is just such a good boon when it comes to bursting down the opposition. And I've talked about how disgustingly strong Scarbrand is, but Nakari can easily kill Scarbrand if Nakari gets all these debuffs off in time. It allows Nakari to just do so much damage. Now, some of the big shortcomings here, though, and, and when this is really going to become an issue, is that the unit roster for Slanesh is strong in that it does do a lot of damage, but it is very weak. It's a very glass cannony, and it requires a lot of micro on your part. Where... Zinch has a lot of micro because you kind of have to keep units out of combat. You have to be good about your charges in combat for Slanesh because of this ability. Devastating Flanker, doubling your charge bonus. If you don't get those double charge bonuses on a lot of these units, they just kind of die too quickly. They can't really get a chance to come online and do tons of damage. Furthermore, they are not great in auto resolve. So you are now forced to fight a lot of these fights, making this a very well, not a very challenging campaign, but a lot more of a challenging campaign than almost any other one we've talked about so far. Again, couple that all with this diplomacy mechanic and dealing with the seductive influence. This is a huge strength because you're going to be able to pull a lot of vassals into you and those are going to give you passive income. They're also going to give you the ability to create ally outposts, maybe giving you Wood Elf Way Watchers or access to a lot of the Empire kind of devastating artillery, whatever it is. But you just have to constantly be on top of this mechanic. And since that tedium can be a little hard for newer players or even older players that just don't want to deal with it, it does kind of stack against the difficulty. Also, the vassal system has not been completely reworked in a brand new way. You still have to deal with some of the shortcomings of dealing with vassals, like coincidentally getting pulled in directions you don't want to go in. A lot of the stuff has been fixed from Warhammer 2, but there still are some issues with vassals that will hopefully get fixed in the early portions of, the camp, of, uh, of Warhammer 3's dev cycle. But those things do stack against you. So looking at poor auto-resolve, a, a uh, roster that forces you to really be really micro-intensive do kind of stack against you as Nakari, who, who will ultimately be a challenging but very rewarding campaign when you jump into playing Slanesh.
our next ogre bro to talk about is Grease's Gold Tooth, who has a very interesting campaign, but also a bit more of a difficult one because of some of the ogre mechanics. So looking at the faction effects here, we see that he gets some bonuses of 20 diplomatic relation with ogre kingdoms, income from trade, and unit mass. Unit mass is essentially the uh, well, unit's mass, and you would take that mass versus the mass of the opposing unit you are charging against. The higher mass means you can displace that unit, knock them over, bulldoze through them, whatever it is. So that's quite nice because it makes your all of your ogres even heavier in combat. Looking at his actual campaign effects, though, he only gets some bonuses from income, sacking, and looting settlements, all plus 50%. I'm sorry, raiding, sacking, and looting plus 50%, but then that upkeep reduction for iron guts minus 50, which he can also then help increase their melee attack and defense through this line. And he can also boost up your ogre bull's weapon strength here, as well as through this right here, the melee attack and charge bonus. But really outside of that, he doesn't get a ton of crazy skills. He gets Tribe Stealer to further increase diplomatic relations and help with melee attack and weapon strength against ogre kingdoms. And he gets this nice camping line to help out with campaign growth and campaign limit. But that's really it. And that, I think, is what makes Greasus' campaign a little difficult, is that he doesn't have a bunch of ways to kind of counteract what he has to deal with. And yes, his big focus is creating this massive ogre kingdom in this location by uniting the clans, more or less. But you'll find that you'll spend a lot of time fighting ogres in this campaign. And I personally find this to be my least favorite campaign in the game. As you can see, it's my least favorite, so it's not the hardest, but it's just not very enjoyable because ogre on ogre fights tend to not be as fun to me. And I find also that because everything's so kind of spread out, I would almost prefer the campaign movement of Scrag on this character. And Scrag's ability to have a disgusting amount of food makes it so that Scrag can really do whatever he wants without worrying about it. But I find that the food or the meat mechanic for Greasus just becomes so hard to keep going because of the amount of fights that are so far and few between as far as like the distance from one location to the next. Like if I want to move from here to here to here, that's three pretty far locations. Whereas in Scrag's campaign, that distance is like the distance between his, both of his provinces. So he gets the chance to get way more food than Greasus does. And because of that, Greasus suffers from having to deal with food consumption causing attrition far more. This adds a lot of just kind of unnecessary nuance to this campaign that I just don't really like as much. I think it makes Scrag a lot more fun. Like I said, if Greasus had the campaign movement range bonuses that, uh, I'm sorry, if Scrag yeah, of, of Scrag, then Greasus would be more fun. You still do get this big substantial one, getting that 20%, but there are so many other benefits that Scrag gets to campaign movement that makes Greasus, I feel, it's a little bit more slow and kind of stuck in the mud a lot of the times in this campaign. So not necessarily a campaign that is overly difficult, but it's one that's really going to test your patience as you deal with a lot of these far-flung issues in the Ogre Kingdoms. Moving into the frozen lands of Kislev itself, we have Tsarina Katarina. Now, this is the actual campaign that the game recommends you play first. I think Miao Ying is just another one of the easier ones it says is you, should, you should go on. But I don't find that to be the case, and that's really because of her start position, her campaign and faction effects, as well as the way that Kislev's um, roster operates. So, taking a look at those actual faction effects, we get Ruler of the Ice Court which doesn't really give us a ton of cool things. You do get access to better Frost Maidens, and you get Frost Maidens quicker, but that's really it. Control and the Devotion mechanic is not that crucial. And looking at her actual campaign effects, Corruption Reduction is very nice, because you will be dealing with lots of Chaos Corruption, but Upkeep Reduction for Ice Guard is also quite good, reducing that by 50%, which you can further increase with uh, Indomitable Spirit, increasing leadership and melee defense for your Ice Guard, and Best of the Court, increasing melee attack, melee defense, and missile strength for those units now on in addition to all that you do have the lore of ice which is good i find it to be way better in multiplayer than it is in single player but you do have stuff like heart of winter which helps delete mobs of units ice sheet which slows things down and frost blades which is great for uh, boosting damage as well as giving magical attacks but it's really not until like rank 14 that you get the war bear that Zarina stops becoming a glass cannon and she can actually kind of hold her own and she isn't just kind of killed off quickly also you get the ability to summon a snow leopard which is quite nice 
But let's take a look here at the unit browser. So the unit browser for Kislev is it has a very slow power spike. You start off with Kossars, and if you're not good about staying on top of your military production, you won't progress to armored Kossars quickly. And you do need to because they are your solid front line. 80 armor, they're going to absorb the charge of all the demons you're going to deal with, and you will deal with them once the rifts open up. Because Kislev also has a mechanic where if your devotion's not high enough, demons just kind of invade your land. So getting access to armored Kossars quickly, and if you're new to the game, you might not think to do that, make sure that your actual that your actual campaign won't just fall to ruins because your starting location too falls into this. If you look over here, the big objective for Kislev, because it's tied to your research, is getting access to Kislev, Erengrad, and Prague. Prague is right there, and Erengrad's like over here in this direction. I can't find the actual actual location. It's like right over here, I think. Yeah, Alexander, yeah, there's Erengrad. So you need to get all three of those, or else your research won't kind of complete. And because you also start pretty centrally located here in the middle of Kislev, you have aggression all around you. Kugoth can come down from this direction. The Demon Prince can come over from this direction as well. You have to deal with Norska. You have to deal with the Rifts. And Scrag the Slaughterer will get big in your campaign. In the NPC, as the NPC faction, there's no one to really directly oppose him, so he will start to eat this entire area. So Katarine has a lot of aggression to deal with, not to mention the fact that you will have aggression from Kosteltian, the other Kislevite on the other end of the, the, the Oblast here. So all that really stacks against you. And I find if you're new to the game, that's going to be scary. It's going to be fun, but it's also going to be scary. So if you're playing this on hard or very hard, you're really going to have a lot to deal with. Not as much as Kosteltian, but still. I find Katarine to be a, quite a difficult campaign just because you have got so much to deal with and so much opposition. And a lot of the Kislev mechanics, such as the Ice Court, doesn't really go towards helping your power spike. And the Adamans don't really come online until later in your campaign. And the supporters function, again, doesn't really contribute to your power spike until the end. And the Motherland invocations won't help you out unless you really get a good amount of devotion going. And even then, they're capped at per 10 uh, or at uh, one invocation per 10 turns. So it's really you against all of chaos. And you really have to be mindful of that playing as Katarine. Now we're into that top three difficulty bracket. And I think Kugoth Plague Father is a very interesting and different campaign. And his difficulty isn't necessarily linked to being a hard campaign in the conventional sense, but I think that his difficulty for me personally is linked to the fact that it's going to eschew the normal way that you play Total War games. He will not be the rapid growing empire that we typically see with almost every other Total War, especially, you know, in previous historical forays. But with Kugoth, it's a much slower burn. You're going to be building a much taller campaign map and with that you're going to just go at a slower pace and that fits his overall army but to me personally i found that to be a huge detractor because i spent so many time so many turns just ending the turn to have my growth grow so that's a big focus point here for kugoth for me and looking at his actual uh, faction effects he does focus heavily on nurglings with recruitment costs and health increases for them and looking to at his campaign effects, he uh, gives us some bonuses for infection cost, noble corruption, and chance of plating, spreading plagues, which is great. Um, also, too, like Nurgling Tide, he can summon up these little guys. Rotting Ways, or I'm sorry, where is it? Uh, uh, bah, aha, Pushlin Abundant, <laughs> Pushlin Abundance, giving uh, the regeneration trait for your Nurglings and reducing their upkeep and recruitment cost. He's really going to be focusing on a lot on those nurglings melee defense for nurglings which is kind of funny right to have a whole doom stack of nurglings and in his entire line he's got a bunch of really fun abilities so i'm not saying that kugoth is not a strong character and that this is not a strong campaign but i just find that you're going to be spending so much time just sitting in one province for the first 10 or 20 turns that it's going to be it's going to be jarring for a lot of people that are maybe new to the game and aren't are going to learn this as maybe the way you play, and that's not true. And people that are veterans to the game who are going to go, well, I can't expand very quickly. My growth is so slow or whatever it is. And also looking at his building browser, 
It is completely different than anything we've ever seen in a Total War game. You're not going up a very linear line. All these move in a circle that will constantly repeat itself if you are in the proper tier of province or region, whatever it is. So that is a little bit of a, of a hurdle, but I think it's pretty easy to understand, right? Like, okay, this will all progress to this point until we get to the third tier by required settlement level of this building, so to automatically construct. And that also changes the way that he recruits units. He recruits units by summoning them into the battlefield through a pool, not a local and a global recruitment. So again, that is a very different mechanic. He plays differently than every character in this game because almost everything is different for him. And just like Nakari, where you have to be on top of your diplomacy, with Kugoth, you have to be on top of your Plague Cauldron. So if you are not constantly putting plagues out, then you're not getting more symptoms. And if you're not getting more symptoms, then you're not getting recipes that give you a lot of the really big boons from playing this campaign. So, again, uh, to me, Kugoth is a very strong character, but a lot of his difficulty lies in the tedium of almost every aspect of it, and not to mention that his unit browser is physically slow on the battlefield. You're looking at 23 for his plague, 23 speed for his plague bearers. Some of the faster things are stuff like your plague toads at 59, your furies at 110, and your rot flies, which are going to be going across the battlefield. But you don't necessarily get tons of access to them like you do for nerglings, which do move pretty quick at 34, and plague bearers. So this is just going to be something that's going to be very new for a lot of players, both new and old to the game. And I think as a, as a result, they're going to have to shift the way that they play Total War Warhammer. The last demon on our list, the Demon Prince, comes in at number two as the hardest campaign in the game. Even though the game recommends, this is one of the ones you start off with. And one of the big reasonings here behind this is start position. It, it's really kind of brutal here for the Demon Prince, for Yuri. And it is still a very fun campaign. I will make that distinction up front. But let's go ahead and take a look at some of these faction effects here. Because you can see that he's the god killer. Access to all demon units in demonic glory. And reign of chaos. So that he really kind of hinges upon this mechanic, right? Demonic glory mechanic that allows you to build out your own custom demon prince. And also for his character details, he gets undivided. So he just gets a bunch of access. So... These access to these gifts are great, and it's cool because you get to custom build out a specific demon prince focusing on any of the lords of, I'm sorry, the gods of chaos that you so wish. And his skill tree is all the research that you would typically have as an, as an independent or different tree. It's all right here. I'm sorry, independent, different button. It's all right here in this skill tree, right? Here's how you get route marcher, but here's also how you get stuff like um, endless March to reduce the corn unit cost or this one for your Nurgle unit cost. Whatever it is, it's all locked here into the skills menu. So as a result, this kind of makes, and he's coincidentally named Karn, not a betrayer, I assure you. This coincidentally kind of makes this character difficult because his starting location here is right on the kind of uh, the gate of the Order Tide. You will be dealing with non-stop incursions from Kosteltian, from Wood Elves, from other um, NPC Empire factions, just constantly harassing your coastline, which is very annoying. And in addition, any access to particularly strong units, you have to wait until you progress through the respective demonic glory uh, tree or, or, or line until you get access to them. And even if you want to go all the way into the undivided line, it's quite a bit of a ways into the campaign until you get access to a lot of the really good heavy hitting units like any of the soul grinders or any of the greater demons. So these things are a lot of gates onto this campaign that will make it hard to climb your way into that mid to end game of the campaign. But when you are, you are rewarded with a custom built badass looking demon prince and you get access to all of these different demonic glory um, attributes, gifts and units from the other gods you want to focus on. So those things are great, but I think if you're brand new to the game, the level of aggression you'll be dealing with is going to be hard. Even if you're a veteran to the game and you're trying to get used to the way Warhammer 3 plays, you're going to deal with a lot of opposition. Not to mention that anyone you piss off up here, 
is also going to start coming for you. You'd have um, Scarbrand's right here. Nakari is right over here. Kugoth is right over here as well. So trying to maintain a good relationship with them is crucial because you do have Norskins who will ally with you, but you have a bunch of dwarfs right here. And of course you do have um, Katarine over here. So you start probably in the centermost location of all of the other legendary lords where they're surrounding you 100% and you have to deal with either allying with them, destroying them, or trying to at least hold them at bay until you're ready to deal with them. In addition to also dealing with having to go into the Chaos Realm and deal with your rifts, which while increasing Chaos Corruption aren't necessarily bad, you don't want to be dealing with a bunch of things when you're in the Chaos Realm or you're trying to fend off these other aggressive uh, movements towards your territory when you have to deal with a random demon incursion. So you will truly be tested playing as the Demon Prince here. And it is, like I said, a very fun campaign, but also a quite a difficult one. All right, number one on our list, the hardest character to play in Total War Warhammer 3 is Kislev's greatest love machine, Kosteltian. So let's take a look at his faction effects, his starting position, because all these things really factor into why this character is so difficult. And it's because the mid and late game for this character really, really suffers. So taking a look at his faction effects, Cultist of Urson, he gets a ward save for Embedded Patriarchs, which is great, but look at the diplomatic relation negative for Ice Court. The Ice Court gets the opposite thing towards him. It's not a huge thing, but you're going to be dealing with so much Kislev opposition that it does make for or, um, trying to unify Kislev and confederate Kislev harder on Kosteltian. It's much easier for, for Katarine. But you do get melee attack and leadership bonuses for Kossars, Kossavai Dervishes, and Horse Archers. In fact, that is your primary unit focus for Kosteltian. Looking at his actual character doll, we get that he gets passive ability of Frenzy for the entire army, which is great. He has the Courage of Sacrifice ability, which increases leadership and melee defense by 5, and Urson's Ward, which will heal him if he's low in um, health. And also there's the By Our Blood ability, which is whenever leadership is wavering or low. All these things really cool, really great. Um, also, he gets access to every single one of the special uh, cult, I'm sorry, great orthodoxy abilities, all of the special, uh, the heal, the melee attack, the, char the vigor, and the charge and leadership bonuses. Again, cool things. But when it comes to his specific line, Gets Casualty Replenishment and Leadership, which is cool. Hit points, nice. Fiery Devotion, this one's actually really solid. It gives Flaming Attacks, Melee Attack, and Leadership in a 35 meter radius around him. And he also gets Enduring Devotion, which increases Melee Defense and Leadership. All these things are cool, but he really doesn't have a way to make units particularly good on the battlefield. He can reduce recruitment cost of the Lord's army and increase local recruitment capacity, which is very nice. It allows you to recruit an army quite quickly, but the ability to have very nice ice guard or stupid strong war bears is outclassed in both Katarine and in Boris. And we've already talked about the unit browser here for uh, Kislev and how it has a slow spike. You want to get to these armored Kossars as fast as possible. And all the bonuses that Kosteltian gives is only to the base Kossar units and then the uh, horse archers as well as Kossavai dervishes. Those units are not going to be as particularly strong against the opposition you're going to be fighting against, which is other Kislev forces, especially in beginning portions of your campaign, and then a ton of demons. It will be nice when you're fighting against Norska, but that'll be only for a little spat in your campaign. Having to have uh, to jump up to the armored Kossars quickly and then not getting any bonuses for anything beyond your, your base units is a bit of a low point because in this starting position, like I just said, you have to deal with other Kislevites that you're fighting with, and you have to deal with a lot more Kislevites over here you're going to be fighting with. And guess what? The Ice Court, you're going to fight with her too. So you have to wade your way through a ton of other Kislevites. You can jump up through the supporters thing here, but anytime you fight another Kislevite, you get minus two supporters. So you're going to be spending your devotion on the Invocation of Tor, which gives you two when fighting a battle. Just basically nullifies the reduction you're dealing with. So you get zero reporter, or <laughs> supporters. Those reporters aren't allowed in here anyway. But either way, like I said, you have to deal with so much in your own area as it comes to your own people that you then have to deal with the Demon Prince who starts right here. And he's going to be knocking on your door by turn 20. 
and you have to deal with any low devotion cost springing up random chaos invasions in your land and then by turn 20 25 you're going to be hit with the rifts and even more demons are going to pop up and not many people in the empire like you so they'll start to have aggression towards you same thing with norska the bad thing about Kosteltian is it's kind of the same thing that the Demon Prince has just on the other side of the river. Rather than dealing with the Order Tide, you're now dealing with the Chaos Tide, the Demon Tide. And you have a bunch of things around you that are ready to fight and kill you. And when you look at Kosteltian's abilities, yeah, that's, this one's cool, right? Leadership and melee defense, but hit points less than 25% and only within 35 meter radius of Kosteltian. Yeah, he can heal himself, but if he's lower than 35% health. And... This Enduring Devotion, great, but you have to get all the way to this portion. And you're going to be spending your early points on stuff like this to increase your uh, support capabilities and your specific line. And you won't even really get a chance to use these to their full extent until you get access to your War Bear, which greatly increases your durability as Costeltium. So all these things combine to make for a very hard campaign. Now, with that being said... I have an absolute blast playing Costeltium because it is so difficult. Because I'm just, I am the true bastion against chaos in the north. So this is why this is the longest one of all of our campaign kind of quick little summaries here. Because this to me is one of the most enjoyable campaigns in Warhammer 3. Because you truly have to be on top of your game with keeping your individual sediments properly fortified, and with having enough armies to move in between all that. It's why you can recruit so, arm, so many armies so quickly as Costeltian, and why you can just have these budget Kossar armies to help you fight against one maybe dedicated army in Costeltian himself. So, while this is difficult, and if you are new to the game, it will be a huge challenge for you. It is still one that's particularly fun because you are, like I said, the true holder of the North, the true warden of the North against the unending tide of chaos and at that it brings our list here to a close so hopefully this has given you an idea of which campaigns are easier and why they're easier and when you jump into the game come february 17th or maybe you've already been playing at this point and at the time as you're watching it you'll find that maybe you think that the demon prince is actually a particularly easy campaign because you do get access to so many different units or maybe kairos is a lot more difficult for you because you don't like using range units this will be a kind of a list that's opinionated but there are certain things that in the current iteration of the game does weigh against people like Costeltian. Every content creator I've shown this list to and asked their opinion on, they all agreed that Scarbrand was probably the easiest character. They, they did tend to stall around uh, the latter portions of the game because of growth, but they all really agreed too that Costeltian was the hardest character because of the odds stacked against him and the fact that your faction and campaign effects don't really help even those odds. So as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. If you have any questions about certain campaign difficulties or maybe certain things that you're hung up on, go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. I'll be releasing a uh, beginner's guide, a beginner's guide to combat, and a provincial overview kind of uh, management guide in the next coming days. And as always, if you do need help choosing any of these campaigns, you can find their respective campaign overviews linked at the uh, playlist at the very end and in the pinned comment. But as always, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.